Hello there, how are you? Uh, we move to part three and now move uh, to that other model for uh, centralizing power. Uh, and uh, uh, England is the primary example of this, uh, what becomes a constitutional monarchy. The question at the top, though it doesn't have a question mark, says, asks, will England become absolutist or constitutional? Uh, that's because the kings, uh, one of whom you see on the left there, in England wanted to do like other monarchs uh, and their counterparts in France and become absolute monarchs. They want all the power in their hands. Uh, most people would, uh, uh, but they fail to uh, do so in the end. Uh, and England becomes a constitutional monarchy against their will. Uh, this is really kind of for two reasons, two reasons that they didn't get what they wanted. Uh, these This group of kings in the 17th century known as the Stuart Kings, uh, again, one of them on the left there. And the, the Stuarts didn't achieve absolute monarchy and were stuck with constitutional monarchy by the end of the century, near the end, because one, uh, they weren't as talented uh, leaders uh, as were some of the others we've already met, Louis XIV in France, Frederick the Great in Prussia. Uh, and secondly, and maybe more importantly, they had to deal with an institution that was already so powerful before this century uh, and entrenched its power a couple centuries before, Parliament, uh, a partly elected body, uh, that it was just too big of an obstacle to get over. They couldn't get Parliament and its members to acquiesce to their authority, at least fully enough, to be absolute monarchs. And so at the end of a civil war, kind of two civil wars in a sense, one of them not being very violent, uh, but uh, it was settled, uh, and the Stuarts, the kings, were defeated, uh, not taken from power entirely, uh, but defeated, uh, and had to then rule alongside of uh, a constitution uh, and a, uh, a, a legislative body, something you know akin to our Congress today. So like our president and Congress split power, share power, uh, that's what sort of England did. Uh, after all was said and done, uh, uh, you know, at, after this century, uh, this guy here is Charles the first, uh, the second of the Stuart kings, uh, and the Stuart kings tended to have kind of the same flaws. Uh, was it genetic? Was it learned? Was it both? Who knows? Uh, but it did seem to run in the family, and uh, they were really good at making enemies of uh, uh, just about everybody. Uh, even uh, people in groups that they didn't need to make enemies out of, they were good at making it anyway, making them anyway. Uh, uh, Charles was prone to loud statements of his own authority. Uh, he was completely unwillingness, unwilling to listen to anyone else. Uh, and keep in mind, he's kind of a would-be absolute monarch, uh, uh, trying to uh, turn England into absolute monarchy by, in part, reducing the power of the parliament. Uh probably wasn't the best idea to do it by trying to just, you know, do it stubbornly, not listen to anybody, uh, declare uh, how powerful you are, uh, you know, arrogantly, and make enemies uh, of a group that you might be able to negotiate with to, uh, 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 you know, uh, agree to more power in your hands. So how does Parliament fight against a divine right king? Uh, uh, that, that question uh, gets us to something we haven't really covered in this era, we see the very end, the last phase in which this uh, was done successfully. Uh, but for centuries before this, kings in Europe usually uh, ruled with divine right authority, which is mean they were uh, seen by God as the rightful rulers. It's the most important way that European kings legitimized themselves, as we talked about before. Uh, it was sort of commonly accepted that uh, if you're the king, uh, uh, you get the support, uh, you better get the support of the uh, uh, Pope and the Catholic Church, if it's a Catholic country, or the church authorities, if it's a Protestant country. Uh, and if the church supports you, then, you know, people will believe that God supports you as the king. So that, that's pretty legitimate uh, if uh, people believe that God uh, wants you to be the king. The problem is, uh, right here, uh, the beginning to middle of the 17th century, 1600s, uh, people are not uh, as likely to believe in divine right as they used to be. So this is kind of the last generation of European leaders that will be able to even use divine right at all to legitimize themselves. Uh, and uh, But there was still enough belief in divine right uh, that the early Stuart kings uh, uh, 
it was difficult to challenge them uh, because uh, too, too much of the population, not all, but too much still believed that the king ruled by divine right. So nobody had the right to challenge his power because it would be an offense against God. And everybody, uh, almost everybody's a serious Christian at the time, uh, uh, serious about their religion, whatever it is at the time. Uh, so uh, you had a problem. Uh, what do you? How do you challenge uh, a divine right king uh, who's unchallengeable? Uh, what you do uh, is you go after his most powerful subordinates, uh, his advisors, who are really powerful people just underneath him. It's like the president's, you know, and our it's like our president's uh, secretary of state, secretary of defense, secretary of treasury. And those are really powerful people. Uh, so if you can't go over, if you can't go after a king and uh, you know outwardly oppose him uh, uh you just aim the, for the next step below and go after and hammer politically uh his uh, you know highest appointed officers uh because they're not divine they don't rule by divine right the only person in the whole country that has divine right behind him is the king so uh they call these sometimes overmighty subjects evil counselors another uh epithet attached to them uh and what they'd say uh, because everybody knew uh, these are think of the uh, the opponents in Parliament, Parliament now trying to find a way to attack a divine right king, oppose him politically. Think of these guys as lawyers. Not all of them were, but increasingly uh, more and more would be lawyers. Uh, uh, so they're making kind of lawyers' arguments. Okay, how can we find a loophole in divine right uh, to sort of use it against the king? Uh, and so if you think of these guys as lawyers, it's it make this makes more sense. Uh, because everybody knew that okay, you, oh, you're not you're not opposing the king, but by opposing his uh, you know a chancellor of the exchequer, the guy who controlled the money and the finances, you're opposing the king's policy. Just one step removed from the king, he just ordered this guy to do this, and now you're opposing what he's doing. Uh, and so uh, everybody knew they were still opposing the king, but what they could and did say, members of parliament, uh, was no, you don't understand. We're actually uh, we're actually on the king's side. What the king doesn't realize is his overmighty subjects, his chancellor of the exchequer, uh, is defying him behind his back, even if it wasn't true. So so they posed uh, as the defenders of the king against the the true enemies of the king, his own uh, appointed uh, you know leaders. Uh, so it was rather clever, uh, and over time uh, worked. Uh, Charles I ran afoul of Parliament so badly uh, and angered other uh, people, other groups, the Puritans, uh, for instance, and there were lots of Puritans in Parliament, so uh, that was an overlapping group anyway, uh, but that eventually uh, things uh, uh, got so bad that a civil war uh, uh, ensued, uh, and the king uh, formed his own army, which you'd expect a king to have an army, but the Parliament uh, formed its own army, which you wouldn't expect. Uh, and they fought it out uh, in England, a bloody civil war, uh, for about five plus years. The king's army, known as the Cavaliers, the parliamentary army with the less uh, dynamic sounding name, the Roundheads. Uh, and this is really a, a, a fight to the finish over who gets to call the shots in England. Uh, is it the king uh, that makes the final decisions or is it the parliament? Uh, although the parliament, at least at first, wasn't uh, uh, you know, trying to get rid of kings, period. Uh, uh, but they were saying we should have at least a strong hand, a large role in calling the shots in making the decisions. Uh, Charles I was ultimately defeated in that civil war uh, by this guy, Oliver Cromwell, uh, who improved the, uh, became known as the New Model Army, uh, using uh, what were the, the latest techniques and organizing and drilling uh, troops and fighting in formation, which wasn't sort of done everywhere, although he took the ideas from Swedish military leaders and Dutch military leaders, uh, but incorporated it here. The king's army didn't. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the parliament's uh, generals, he, he just at first being one of them, but then rose to the top uh, uh, because of his organization of the new model army. Uh, uh, Cromwell was a Puritan member of Parliament, the House of Commons, the elected part of it, elected official, uh, but then became a general like some of the others did uh, in fighting the king uh, over who gets to call the shots. But uh, this hadn't been expected before. The king, uh, well, 
this part had, the king was not only defeated, he was arrested, tried for treason, convicted, uh, and yes, uh, uh, executed uh, by losing his head uh, at the hands of an axeman. There was no guillotine yet that comes in the next century, uh, so powerful people were killed uh, with an axe. Uh, and it's rather gruesome. It was a public uh, sport, by the way, spectator sport. Crowds are always on hand, as they were on the day of Charles I's uh, execution. But I think it was January 31st, 1649. Uh, I think that was it. Uh, so the, I don't know why I remember that. By the way, uh, if, if you were a powerful person uh, and you were going to be executed, you wanted to have your head chopped off. Uh, because uh, the average people, you know, the dirt bags, they got hung. Uh, so if you were important or thought you were important uh, and you found out you were scheduled to be hung, uh, you'd go and complain. I'm not kidding. And so, wait a minute, I'm, I'm more important than that. Uh, you can't hang me. You have to chop my head off. Uh, that's, that's insulting. That's disrespectful to me. Uh, I deserve to have my head uh, severed from my shoulders permanently. I'm not kidding. That happened because uh, it was uh, you know, part of your station or status. Uh, the higher status people got executed by axemen, beheaded, uh, and the lesser status people got hung uh, by the neck with a rope. Uh, so brutal uh, either way. Uh, Oliver Cromwell uh, turned England uh, into a military dictatorship because not only did they execute the king, mainly at his behest, since he's the leader of the army now, which is in control of England, uh, but they abolished the monarchy. Uh, and this brings on what's known as the interregnum, about a full decade, the 1650s, where power, again, through kind of uh, you know, uh, the day-to-day -day drift of politics, this wasn't inevitable and it wasn't planned, uh, but po power ended up more and more in Cromwell's hands to the point where he became kind of a military dictator light. Uh, Parliament still sat and it had some power. Cromwell didn't desire to make himself a complete, absolute leader. He wasn't a monarch. He wasn't a king. He wasn't calling himself the king. He called himself Lord Protector, uh, which is high and mighty enough. Uh, Professor Perry says in the context of the 1650s, when he uh, uh, was Lord Protector, Cromwell was a moderate Republican who also believed in limited religious toleration for Protestants, not for Catholics, uh, yet history has painted him somewhat unjustly as a military dictator. So uh, uh, Perry disagrees somewhat. That's why I said a military dictator light, though. Uh, uh, but uh, certainly power was not spread out in the way that Parliament had fought for and that even he had fought for. Uh, uh, they, they'd wanted a constitutional monarchy. It certainly wasn't that uh, during uh, this sort of odd period where there's no king, no monarchy. Uh, it was good times for the Puritans, uh, because uh, Cromwell was a Puritan, so he implemented policies that favored them. Terrible time for the Scots uh, and the Irish, uh, because uh, he pummeled them uh, by attacking them and uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, handling them uh, rather roughly. The Irish still uh, remember the curse of Cromwell, as they, as they call it. But when Cromwell passed away, he had plans to uh, hand over the Lord Protectorship to his son, Richard Cromwell, but suffice it to say that Richard Cromwell was no Oliver Cromwell and wasn't able to get, garner enough respect and wield enough power uh, to hold on. And the movers and shakers, members of parliament that had now a lesser role, or had for you know, those 10 years uh, of the interregnum, now uh, stepped up uh, and thought, okay, we need to figure out what to do because uh, Richard Cromwell is not getting power. This experiment hasn't worked very well. Cromwell as dictator, whatever you want to call him, uh, um, you know, what wasn't the solution uh, uh, to the problem, and they've abolished the monarchy. To show you that they didn't have a lot of ideas about what they might be able to do uh, to, you know, institute uh, a government, uh, what did they do? They invited uh, the Stuart uh, uh, family back uh, onto the throne and reinstated the monarchy. Uh, in fact, it was this guy's older brother, you see on the screen, Charles II, uh, this is the younger brother, James II, who was called back uh, to the throne. He'd been living in exile, protected by the Catholic king, Louis XIV, who we already know. Uh, but uh, uh, the movers and shakers in parliament uh, called the son 
of the guy who had just gotten his head chopped off 10 years before uh, back into power and reinstated the monarchy. Uh, but this time, uh, you know, they basically were saying, you're going to have to share power with us. Uh, and Charles II turned around and didn't really do so, uh, showing uh, the Stuart capacity yet again for pissing everybody off. Uh, when Charles died uh, of natural causes uh, without an, a male heir to the throne, James II, his younger brother, who had been a successful admiral in the English Navy, uh, became the next King of England. Uh, and uh, he was probably the most hated uh, king of all uh, among the Stuarts, mainly because he was Catholic. Uh, actually, his older brother, who just passed away, uh, had been kind of a secret Catholic, but this guy was an open Catholic in what had become a, a very fervent uh, Protestant country. Uh, there were still a minority of Catholics in England, but they were pretty much abused, so they had to kind of uh, practice their religion you know, uh, in hiding, kind of underground not literally, but uh, you know, quietly. Uh, uh, they, did, they had rights stripped for them if they were known Catholics. Uh, so James coming around boasting about being a Catholic, reigning openly as a Catholic king, proved mightily unpopular, to put it mildly. Uh, and the, the, he had the same penchant to anger everybody, all these different groups, you know, Puritans, you can see why, uh, Parliament, again, uh, and many others. Uh, uh, but they were tolerating him uh, for the sake of stability until he committed sort of the ultimate sin, uh, which was uh, having a child, uh, a male child, who would be a male heir to the throne. Why? Uh, because uh, as a Catholic, he married a Catholic princess from Italy or Spain. I think Italy, I could be wrong. Uh, nonetheless, the, the child was clearly going to be baptized into the Catholic faith. So they were tolerating him before a child entered the picture because they thought, okay, we don't like it, but we can tolerate, you know, one Catholic king, uh, uh, you know, since the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but once he had a child, it's like, well, no, we're gonna, now we could have two Catholic kings. And not only that, it might now become part of the line of succession where now the, uh, the baby grows up to be king. He's a Catholic, marries a Catholic woman. They have a baby. Uh, now he becomes the third Catholic king in a row, and England could go right back to being an officially Catholic country like it did, like it was before the Reformation, uh, and this was intolerable. Uh, so uh, seven mover and shaker dukes and, uh, uh, you know, muckamucks got together secretly and looked for a solution, somebody to replace James II. There were all kinds of rumors uh, that said this was a plot, uh, that there was no baby, uh, the queen didn't even give birth, they're just trying to impose Catholicism on the country again, uh, what was known as the warming pan baby. The idea that uh, some peasant uh, uh, you know, had a, a, a newborn baby stolen from her uh, and they put it in a warming pan, like bring, people are bringing food into the palace as normal, but they're actually smuggling in a baby uh, and then say, hey, look, the queen just had a, a child. Guess what? It's, it's going to be baptized Catholic. The next king is going to be a Catholic. Uh, that was all rumor, all conspiracy theory, uh, hysteria. Uh, but you, it, it does show, it's kind of funny, but it does show how serious this was taken, uh, how people were freaked out over the potential for uh, a Catholic dynasty uh, put in place. So the immortal seven, these seven guys, as they're known now, uh, they reached out and tried to find uh, a suitable replacement. Uh, and it was it, it looked like it was going to be really hard because the person that had to replace James as king had to have three qualities, uh, for sure. Had to have three attributes. One, he had to be a Protestant. That was certain. Uh, uh, two, he had to be uh, uh, legitimizable. He had to make him legitimate somehow. How are they going to do that? Uh, and three, he had to have enough military muscle to push the king of England out of the way. Where are you going to find that guy? Uh, uh, that's going to be a long uh, sort of job search. Uh, nope, just go right across the English Channel and find William of Orange, uh, the stat holder or effective ruler of the Netherlands, uh, who was a Protestant. He was already married in to the Stuart family. Uh, as you probably know by now, they married, intermarried uh, into one uh, royal family after another. Uh, and so uh, he's already an in-law of the Stuarts. Uh, and since he's the leader of the Dutch Republic, uh, who was already fighting uh, Louis XIV in kind of ongoing wars, uh, he had a pretty large uh, and sophisticated army. 
uh, so uh, amazingly, uh, it seems like it would be hard to find a Protestant uh, who's legitimizable, who also has a big army, uh, a powerful army. Uh, but uh, uh, they found that guy in William of Orange. Uh, so uh, uh, he proved to be the guy, the perfect guy. Uh, they invited him secretly to invade England, and he obliged uh, in 1687. Uh, and uh, uh, the King of England, James II, who we just saw, did what any proud King of England would do. He ran away. Uh, he decided not to fight uh, and uh, uh, went into exile like his uh, uh, father before him, no, brother before him, uh, went into exile uh, in Europe. I'm getting my Stuarts mixed up myself. So uh, the Stuarts would actually try to regain power twice uh, in uh, ensuing decades to no avail. Uh, they were gone. Why did James I not fight it out? Uh, I, I say... This is, I say it simply, but because he could count, uh, what do I mean? Well, mainly he could count, uh, you know, uh, support in the army and amongst his generals and officers. How many support me? One, two, three, I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, right? He realized he was wildly unpopular and even worried that his own military ranks uh, would sort of join the other side. Uh, so he decided, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to save my skin and not end up like my father uh, with his head, uh, again, separated from his shoulders. Uh, and this, uh, what's known as the Glorious Revolution, partly because it wasn't bloody since uh, James II uh, uh, absconded, uh, there wasn't a, a major set of battles here at all. So uh, a, a revolution happened basically peacefully. Uh, because it's 1688, Glorious Revolution, uh, the, the moment that England can say, and historians do, uh, that England was now a constitutional monarchy. After this almost century-long battle uh, to see uh, whether it would be an absolute monarchy or not, uh, it's finally uh, been decided. Now, they didn't know it was going to be decided permanently at the time. Uh, we know now that this was a major turning point, but they saw it somewhat as such already. Uh Perry says the Revolution Settlement of 1688 and 1689, meaning for all the legal stuff uh, they sort of uh, to make this happen, resolved the profound constitutional and social tensions of the 17th century and laid the, laid the foundations of the English government that exists today. Uh, the year 1688 saw the creation of a new public and political order that would become the envy of enlightened reformers. So it's from this point forward that England becomes a constitutional monarchy more and more uh, emphasis over time on the constitutional and decreasing on the monarchy itself, eventually moving to a, uh, becoming a democracy uh, over the next uh, couple centuries plus. Uh, but also uh, that England was the country in Europe from this point forward that kind of had its house in order. Uh, lots of turmoil here in this century that we just saw and bloodshed uh, and political wrangling. But from here on in, England has a stable uh, a government, uh, uh, the most stable in Europe, uh, and then turns that into enormous military power and enormous wealth. Uh, and so they become kind of the number one country uh, in terms of wealth and power in Europe on the heels of the Glorious Revolution. The Dutch Republic, uh, we should look at quickly, is sort of a, a just one more example of something other than absolute monarchy. Uh, this wasn't a constitutional monarchy. Uh, a republic uh, uh, means a form of government, uh, right, that has power spread out, uh, like our republic uh, was founded uh, uh, as. Uh, so uh, the Dutch Republic was sort of even something closer to a democracy even then. Uh, uh, Richard Dunn, in a book uh, about this time period in Europe, uh, says the uh, talking about the Dutch uh, that they were the most enterprising businessmen in the 17th century in Europe. Uh, and did so by pooling resources, uh, uh, or by pooling resources, the Dutch merchants were able to undertake ventures which would have been too expensive and risky for individual businessmen. Uh, great numbers of investors, big and small, uh, organized themselves into chartered companies, like the Dutch East India Company, which you see talked about in the third quote there. Uh, they created a worldwide empire by the middle of the century, huge trading networks, uh, and were basically doing the business uh, of Europe. I won't read all of those quotes there. They had the biggest fleet of merchant ships uh, in Europe. They, they did most of the carrying trade, meaning carrying of trade goods uh, across the seas. So uh, even if France was trading with, uh, you know, 
Denmark, uh, it was oftentimes on Dutch ships, so they were making money uh, uh, by everybody paying them to send their uh, you know, goods back and forth. But they also uh, were in, engaged in banking uh, and insurance uh, and trading of all kinds of good, uh, fishing, uh, herring uh, in the Baltic, and uh, you know, trading that for grain uh, from Denmark, or, you know, cradle, cattle from somewhere else. So for, for a time, this tiny country, the Netherlands, uh, was arguably the richest in all of Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think it's an accident or a, a coincidence uh, that their wealth uh, uh, was done in a place uh, that wasn't an absolute monarchy, uh, but that was a republic. Uh, the constitutional monarchy in England across the channel uh, I think was better for commerce and trade and economic development than was absolute monarchy and a republic even more so uh, for reasons we won't get into now but we can sort of explore later. The butcher, brewer, or baker uh, a phrase stolen from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations published in 1776 early capitalist society so what is capitalism? Where did it come from? Uh, good question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, sorry to quote here, but sometimes uh, it helps. So uh, I'm quoting myself here. This is my own definition, uh, although it is accurate. Uh, an economic system with a market economy, this is the definition of capitalism, uh, meaning that most decisions are left in the hands of individuals and organizations with little government interference theoretically none. Uh, such a system relies on legal protection of liberty and private property, since economic decisions are in private hands. Decisions and actions are in theory, and usually in practice, guided by supply, demand, and free competition. Markets, uh, whether they be for manufactured goods, currency, stocks, or even labor, are subject to the same forces. The price mechanism and division of knowledge maximize allocation of resources and goods. Uh, individuals are driven by the incentive of profit and material gain under capitalism. Uh, a capitalist system is not created by anyone or any single organization or government, but represents the gradual development of countless economic actions over long periods of time. However, as it develops, the system is channeled and reformed by leaders, governments, businesses, etc., etc. Well, there's a lot to take in there. For now, I'll just uh, comment on the last part of that. So a capitalist system isn't created by anybody. Like, hey, let's create a capitalist system. Uh, it's sort of people, uh, capitalism in a sense sort of naturally tends to develop, uh, maybe not full on. Uh, but that doesn't mean there is no deliberate decision making. Of course, there's a lot. Uh, but uh, leaders, actors in the economy uh, make decisions at times to try to, uh, you know, uh, smooth out the rough edges and establish policies uh, that sort of uh, hem the markets in a little bit to make them more effective and fit with other social needs other than just economic needs. Uh, so these are sometimes called uh, by economists, particularly libertarian economists, as spontaneous uh, orders. It's not always a, a economic systems. It can be a legal system, etc., uh, that develop uh, uh, in a way kind of organically. They develop on their own uh, without pre-planning. Uh, and then after that, uh, again, uh, uh, leaders, intellectuals, uh, engineers, managers, etc., find a way to take it and sort of mold it into something uh, even more effective and efficient. Uh, but it starts out uh, and for, you know, for most of its uh, existence uh, is driven uh, by uh, uh, forces that are sort of beyond what anybody is planning. Part of the reason I say this is because this gets us then into um, capitalism and ism, uh, one of the ideologies we're going to confront in this class. In fact, it gets into a number of them because in a socialist economy, they do create a socialist economy. Uh, they don't tend to evolve. Uh, they tend to be ideas about, okay, how can we create a different system than capitalism and we'll put this place, place here and you know, by decision-making and deliberate action. Uh, a capitalist system happens over hundreds uh, or more years. Uh, a recent book, uh, Short History of Capitalism, uh, which is a pretty good primer on the subject, says uh, about uh, the definition that 
this is my definition, but uh, it, what he says still fits. Such a working definition, and mine is certainly a working definition, delineates capitalism as an ideal type, a model uh, that one uses even though one knows it is not wholly identical with historical reality. Instead, reality corresponds to it in ways and to degrees that are different and ever-changing. In this manner, it is possible to apply the concept to eras going back a long way, eras in which the concept, capitalism, was not yet in use, uh, and when uh, what it meant existed only in tiny rudiments, so little parts of capitalism, but not, uh, you know, not all the way, as trace elements of a kind of proto-capitalism in small amounts or only little capitalist islands in a sea of non-capitalist conditions. Uh, a fancy way of saying that it's hard to know when capitalism actually began. Uh, it also, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, well, it's, it's part of the spontaneous order idea that I presented uh, you know, uh, above. Uh, some historians think it began as early as the Middle Ages. Some uh, say as late as the 18th century. A lot of people say in between. I think it's safe to say, again, keeping in, in keeping with what this guy says here, uh, is that uh, elements of capitalism were there a long time ago uh, and uh, it gradually sort of added other uh, elements. Uh, so it's hard to say when it began. Uh, it's in the process of kind of evolving uh, throughout uh, hundreds and hundreds of years of European uh, and eventually world history. So looking at other features of capitalism uh, around this time, in the 16th century, uh, there was uh, one round uh, of what historians have come to call the price revolution. There were a number of price revolutions in Europe uh, and even globally, uh, uh, but this one is the one that affects uh, you know, us in this, in this class right at this time. Uh, prices uh, made a gradual rise uh, through the course of the century. Uh, population uh, increase, uh, this is what really caused it. Uh, population was going way up. Uh, and so there's a greater demand for goods and food and everything else leading to inflation. So it's, a su it's supply and demand. Uh, also, uh, uh, this isn't as important as the population increase uh, in explaining the rise in prices or inflation, but uh, a huge amount of gold and silver was brought uh, from the Americas, stolen by the Spanish uh, and entered into the you know economy and the money systems of Europe. Uh, and this caused inflation as well. There's so much gold and silver, mostly silver. Uh, the rise in prices incentivized greater production as higher prices meant more profit. That's the key uh, uh, point. So that's the one to remember right in the middle there. The rise in prices incentivized, mean, meaning gave uh, you know farmers, uh, shop owners, uh, you know, manufacturers of shoes or whatever else incentive uh, to produce more uh, because uh, the prices were higher. There's more demand for their products. So, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to get into business or I'm going to increase my business, uh, increase the uh, amount of production, the size, so all leading towards uh, economic growth. Uh, the middle class uh, derived much of their wealth through trade and manufacturing from this point forward uh, uh, and their social and political status increased accordingly though not easily. Uh, England is the country uh, where the middle, the rising middle-class businesses, businessmen uh, have uh, less trouble breaking into the upper class along with the nobility. Uh, there's more pushback by the nobility in other countries like Spain and France. Uh, but nonetheless, the middle class is uh, you know, slowly, uh, not even steadily, but gradually uh, you know, using their wealth to increase their social status and their power. Peasant farmers, the majority of the people in, everywhere, at first were harmed by this because their cost of living just went up. Uh, but uh, they benefited once uh, they were able to get their, if they were, and most people were in time, able to uh, grow surplus crops and cash crops that you know were uh, lucrative on the market. Surplus means more than you know you need to feed your family, so you can sell it. Uh, so once they could sort of uh, grow. Uh, enough crops and cash crops, uh, then they entered the market as well. Uh, and uh, they benefited from the cost increases, uh, price increases, because prices for food were higher because there's more mouths to feed with population growth as well. The nobility, who lived mostly off of fixed rents, uh, suffered relative uh, uh, economic decline uh, in the inflationary period. So their power on status uh, began to decline ever so slightly. Now there's going to be 
uh, in Europe and uh, other parts of the world, an ongoing battle for power between sort of the old money people, the nobility, and the new money people, and the growing capitalists. Uh, and so the the decline of the nobility, uh, uh, the traditional wealthy and powerful, uh, is slow. They don't go away easily. Uh, they're not pushed out easily. But uh, this is a trend that's only going to continue. Urbanization uh, and merchants uh, uh, in the cities uh, started to create uh, a an alternative social order. You see this particularly in England uh, and Holland or Netherlands, uh, the two most outstanding trade countries already by the 17th century. Dutch East India Company, the East India Company, and they had a bunch of other companies in other parts of the world as well. Uh, but uh, the English merchant. Uh, of the period Thomas Munn proudly wrote in the 1620s, uh, which is the great revenue of the king, the honor of the kingdom, the noble professions of the merchant, the school of our arts, the supply of our wants, the employment of our poor, the improvement of our, our lands, the nursery of our mariners, uh, the walls of the kingdom, the means of our treasure, the sinews of our wars, the terror of our enemies. Uh, uh, he's bragging uh, uh, you know, profusely saying it's the merchants, the businessmen, the capitalists that are doing everything of value uh, in this country. Uh, it's not the kings. It's not the nobility. Uh, it's the business uh, people that are the movers and shakers. So this was kind of a growing mentality. Uh, and particularly, again, in cities, as I said, uh, uh, there's kind of now a new way of life, which really centers around capitalism. It's a little slower uh, to become kind of the way of life uh, in the countryside. But uh, these weren't free markets uh, uh, by any means yet. Uh, remember, these are mercantilist systems, and uh, mercantilism uh, means you know, government's involvement in the economy. And in the case, uh, the specific sense uh, we see here, it's the navies uh, of these countries protecting their trade routes uh, with big ships, with lots of cannons sticking out that could blow anybody out of the water, or at least theoretically would blow anyone out of the water if they messed with our trade. Well, this is at government expense, at taxpayer expense. It's a lot of money, as you could, I'm sure, see. Uh, to outfit uh, and supply ships like this and pay the sailors, uh, put uh, you know, buy all the weapons that go on them. Uh, and so this is the government slash public picking up the tab for protecting uh, trade vessels that are on their way to India or wherever else they are. Uh, so sea power uh, actually became an important part uh, of the uh, growth of the European uh, economies through capitalism. There's also a commercial revolution in the 17th and 18th centuries uh, throughout Europe, uh, which I've really already said without actually calling it commercial revolution, but this means a huge uptick in trade and commerce overall. Uh, so uh, as Isser Wallach says in his book on 18th century Europe, uh, in this era, when the call of the market beckoned as never before, the leading figures were the traders, especially merchants engaged in overseas trade. Uh, their combined enterprise assured that Western Europe would stand at the center of an expansive global economy. So here we get back into one of our other major themes in the class, globalization. Uh, the central feature of these developments from a geopolitical perspective was the rivalry of Britain and France. Uh, that rivalry was being played out in five zones, the East Indies, the West Indies, which is the Caribbean, uh, uh, North America, Latin America, and Western Africa. Uh, these constituted the periphery of the global economy that was being exploited by the core European states. So uh, you can see international trade here, uh, much of it competition between the two big players at this point, Britain and France. Uh, and a lot of ugliness. Slavery, of course, is a big part of this, uh, etc., as we'll see. So we see the tentacular growth of world trade, uh, as it says uh, at the top. Uh, more and more economic activity, according to the historian John Brewer, became linked to long-distance, long-range, large-scale international markets. Colonies were the fastest-growing markets, uh, and they received disproportionate imp uh, emphasis, uh, not only because of the swiftness of their expansion, but also because they contributed to some of the most visible changes in economic and social life. Uh, I don't have time to go into all the ways, but colonies uh, you know, 
acquiring colonies by force, as we know uh, was the, the way uh, that it was done, uh, gave uh, the country that colonizes somebody else huge economic advantages as well as political military uh, advantages uh, so they could grow a lot of their crops in somebody else's land and then save that land to do something else at home uh, so the uh, connection between trade uh, colonial empires uh, right and capitalism uh, uh, and colonies uh, is uh, huge Slaves, sugar, and guns, the Atlantic system, or uh, sometimes known as the triangular trade. Uh, and uh, as uh, the current uh, uh, scholar uh, Ibram Kendi says in a really good book, fairly recent, called Stamped from the Beginning, The De Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, he says Western Europe's triangular trade was flourishing. Great Britain, France, and colonial America principally furnished ships and manufactured goods. The ships sailed to West Africa, and traders exchanged these goods at a profit for human merchandise. Manufactured cloth became the most sought-after item in 18th century Africa for the same reason, reason cloth was coveted in Europe. Nearly everyone in Africa, as in Europe, wore clothes, and nearly everyone in Africa, as in Europe, desired better clothes. Only the poorest of African people did not wear uh, an upper garment, uh, but this small number became representative in the European mind. It was the irony of the age. Slave traders knew that cloth was the most desired commodity in both places, uh, but at the same time, some of them were producing the racist idea that Africans walked around like animals, meaning like naked. Uh, producers of this racist idea had to know their tales were false, uh, but they went on producing them anyway to justify their lucrative commerce in human beings. So he's saying, it's, you know, people of Africa uh, desired and you know, had demand for cloth, just like people in Europe, but that many Europeans still talked about Africans as being running around naked like animals. Uh, so uh, sadly, slavery is a huge part of uh, the commercial revolution that helped make Europe uh, rich and powerful, uh, which is kind of the direction that we're going. Uh so slavery, the slave trade, and the American colonies. Uh, Kent, Professor Candy again, the slave ships traveled from Africa to the Americas where dealers exchanged at another uh, uh, profit newly enslaved Africans for raw materials that had been produced by the long enslaved Africans. The ships and traders returned home and began the process anew, providing a triple stimulus for European commerce and a triple exploitation of African people, practically Practically all the coastal manufacturing and trading towns in the Western world developed an enriching connection to the transatlantic slave trade. Profits exploded with the growth and prosperity of the slave trade in Britain's principal port, Liverpool. The principal American slave trading uh, port was Newport, Rhode Island. And the proceeds uh, produced mammoth fortunes that can be seen uh, in the mansions still dotting the town's historic waterfront. He means today. Uh, uh, it is true uh, then that, uh, you know, the huge growth in European trade uh, and, uh, you know, increase in wealth uh, was uh, uh, to some degree, uh, to a large degree, off the backs of uh, African uh, uh, slave labor, uh, which was uh, unbelievably inhuman, uh, 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 cruel uh, and unjust. The pros and cons of capitalism. Uh, Professor Bentley, uh, lovable author of our textbook, says capitalism generated considerable wealth, uh, but its effects were uneven and sometimes unsettling. Economic development and increasing prosperity were noticeable in Western Europe, particularly England, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Yet Eastern Europe experienced much less economic ferment, and Poland and Russia increasingly became suppliers of grain and raw materials rather than centers of trade or production. So Peter the Great uh, uh, didn't get uh, what he wanted, really, at least uh, uh, you know, uh, by this time, well after he had died. Even in Western Europe, early capitalism encouraged social change that sometimes required painful adjustments to new conditions. Uh, it's true uh, that uh, capitalism changed everything in European society, everywhere else it went as well, uh, and sometimes in very scary, uh, anxiety-producing and negative uh, ways. 
He goes on to say, the capitalist economic order developed as businessmen learned to take advantage of market conditions by building efficient networks of transportation and communication. Their enormous profits fueled suspicion. They took advantage of those in difficulty, uh, but their activities also supplied hungry communities uh, with the necessities of life, even if the price was high. So saying, okay, you can see sort of world trade uh, and Europeans you know, command of it uh, during this uh, period uh, as about the rich taking advantage of the poor, both within a European country and between rich countries and poor countries. Uh, but you can also say at the same time uh, that uh, however unequal it was, uh, it the, the trade did uh, uh, bring food and other necessities as well as luxury goods uh, and sort of move them around the world uh, uh, more easily than ever before. 